Welcome to section 26 of viruses. This is our virus overview figure, and in this video we'll be discussing influenza virus, which you can see right here. This scene will take place near a small neighborhood concert with some people playing the flute. The flute sounds like influenza, so it will be our symbol for this virus. Influenza is a member of the orthomyxovirus family. So to help you remember this, we've added an orthodontist business to the image. We can see the orthodontist working on a patient through the window. Orthodontist, orthomyxovirus. Before we go much further, take a second to appreciate the background. Notice that we've intentionally made this image with a lot of warm colors, which is to help you remember that influenza virus is an RNA virus. If you look at the top right side of the sky, you can also see a rain cloud, and this is here to help you remember that influenza virus is a negative sense virus. Despite the rain, this incredible flute concert has attracted some people. You can see that they're waiting in a line to get into the concert. The line is to help you remember that influenza virus has a linear RNA structure. Now we've added a car to the scene. These guys parked their car here to see the concert, but started having car problems. So they popped the hood to check out any issues with the V8 engine. The number eight, in V8 engine should help you remember that the RNA structure has eight segments. Next, you can see that we've shown a helical staircase going up to the orthodontist's office. This is here to help you remember that influenza virus has a helical shaped capsid. Now, if you look inside of the orthodontist's office, you can see that we've shown a fish tank with a nuclear sign on it. I guess these are genetically altered radioactive fish, so he has to warn his patients about them. In any case, this should help you remember that influenza replicates in the nucleus of the host cell. As he's working on one patient, he hears a knock on the entrance from a concerned mother. Let's zoom up so you can see this better. Notice that the mother is pounding on the door and saying, he needs in. This is because the child just got his tooth knocked out, as you can see by the white tooth that he's holding in his hand. The phrase he needs in sounds like hemagglutinin, which should help you remember that influenza virus produces glycoproteins present on the surface of the virus and that they facilitate viral entry into the host cell. To help you remember that this glycoprotein is associated with viral entry into the host cell, we've shown the mother knocking on the entrance to the orthodontist's office. Now notice that the woman yelling is grabbing this door knocker, which is shaped kind of like an antibody. This represents the fact that antibodies can be formed against hemagglutinin. And since hemagglutinin is needed to enter the host cell, antibodies against it would confer immunity. Therefore, this idea is here to help you remember that the immune system can produce antibodies against hemagglutinin, which can provide future immunity to similar strains of influenza. Now you can see that we've shown a patient just leaving the exit of the orthodontist's office. If we zoom up, you can see that she's holding a pack of new erasers in her hand. If your experiences with dentists were anything like mine, then you may have memories of leaving the dentist's office with a pencil, toothbrush, or some other little gift like a new pack of erasers. And this is exactly what happened with this girl. She just finished up with the orthodontist, and he gave her a pack of new erasers as she was leaving. Anyway, new eraser sounds like neuraminidase. This is an enzyme that influenza produces and is associated with the release of viral progeny from the host cell. Once the viruses exit the host cell, they go on to infect adjacent cells. So we've intentionally shown this scene occurring near the exit sign because it can be thought of as an enzyme that helps viral progeny exit the host cell. Neuraminidase is an antiviral drug target because if a drug can disrupt this process, then you can imagine that it would essentially contain the infection and limit its spread to adjacent cells. One of the most commonly used drugs is oseltamivir, but other drugs with similar names, such as zanamivir, may also be used. To help you remember oseltamivir, we've shown this guy attempting to sell the patient hot tamales. Tamale sounds like Tamiflu, which is the brand name for oseltamivir. So zanamivir and oseltamivir, or Tamiflu, can be used to treat influenza, and they work by disrupting neuraminidase. All right, before we discuss more of the image, perhaps it would be best if I took a step back to explain the next ideas conceptually, and then we'll return to the image to help you memorize this information. So influenza viruses exhibit what's known as genetic shift and genetic drift. Let's discuss genetic shift first. As you can see, virus A has eight segments of blue colored RNA strands, whereas virus B has eight red colored RNA strands. In other words, the two genomes are drastically different from one another and produce different versions of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Also notice that in this example, we've stated that virus A has the capability of infecting humans, whereas virus B infects animals, such as birds or pigs. Occasionally, these two drastically different viruses can infect the same cell and exchange genetic information, which is known as reassortment. Notice that if this occurs, then a new virus is produced, which we've indicated in this image by virus C. As you can see, the new genome is drastically different and contains elements from both virus A and virus B. Because many of the elements from virus A were maintained, this new novel virus still has the ability to infect humans. 
Genetic shift is a very dangerous process because the novel virus is so unique that it can evade the immune system and infect many people. This is why genetic shift is known to cause pandemics, which are widespread infections that may infect entire countries or even the entire world. On the other hand, genetic drift is a much more benign process compared to genetic shift. This occurs as a result of gradual random mutations. So notice that right here, we've shown a change to one little segment of one of the RNA strands. In other words, the virus has only slightly altered its genome. So the hemagglutinin or neuraminidase elements may only be slightly different. This is why this process confers some resistance to the novel virus, allowing it to infect a lot of people in a community, but won't go on to cause a worldwide pandemic. Therefore, genetic drift can cause epidemics in communities, but is not nearly as lethal as genetic shift. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image to help you memorize these details. Notice that now we've added more information below the orthodontist sign. Now it says Dr. Pepper which is the orthodontist's name. And this is followed by some letters that appear to be drifting up into the air by the wind. These letters can be thought of as a symbol for the viral genome. The fact that they're randomly drifting into the air should help you remember that genetic drift is due to random mutations. Also, the fact that this is occurring by our symbols that represent hemagglutinin and neuraminidase should help you remember that genetic drift is caused by random mutations in the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase genes. To represent genetic shift, we've added another guy to the scene. Let's zoom up on him so you can see things better. First, notice that he's holding a gear shift handle in one of his hands. He's a con artist and tries to sell assorted candy to patients leaving the orthodontist's office. So he tells them a sob story about how his car broke down and his gear shift handle is broken in hopes that they'll buy candy from him. Anyway, the gear shift handle should help you think of genetic shift. You can see that his assorted chocolate box is in the other hand, and this is here to help you think of genetic reassortment. He also has a pet bird, or animal, on his shoulder which should help you remember that genetic shift occurs when a virus that normally infects animals exchanges information with a virus that infects humans. So putting all of this together should help you remember that the influenza virus exhibits genetic shift, which is when two distinct strains undergo genetic reassortment, resulting in a novel strain. Finally, we've shown him wearing a skull on his shirt to help you remember that genetic shift is more deadly than genetic drift and is associated with pandemics. All right, let's move on to discuss some of the clinical features of influenza. Notice that we've added some heat lamps out in front of the stage to help keep the fans warm in the rain. Just like in our other videos, this is here to help you remember that the influenza virus may cause a fever. Now we've added a fan crowd surfing, but his arm bumped into something and now you can see him holding it in pain. This is to help you remember that the influenza virus may cause myalgias. Another oblivious fan nearby drank soda that went down the wrong pipe, and now we can see him coughing it up. This is to help you remember that the influenza virus typically presents with a cough. Now we've shown some smoke coming out of the broken down car. If we zoom up, you can see one of the guys coughing as the smoke comes near his face. This is our symbol for pneumonia, which should help you remember that the influenza virus can cause primary pneumonia, which is when the virus directly infects the lungs. However, we've also shown several references to our bacteria videos. For example, they have a sign on their car that says, The Office, which should make you think of Haemophilus influenzae. He has this sign here because he's always on the go and his car has literally become his office. The Merlin tattoo with a staff on his arm is a reference to our Staffarius video. And the lawnmower tattoo is a reference to our strep pneumonia video. He got these tattoos because he has an obsession with Merlin and his first job was lawn care, which he loved. Anyway, all these references next to the guy coughing should help you remember that the influenza virus may also cause secondary bacterial pneumonia, which is most often caused by Staphorius, strep pneumonia, and Haemophilus influenzae. This typically occurs one or more days after the symptoms of influenza begin to resolve. The car itself is our recurring symbol for the heart and should help you remember that the influenza virus can cause cardiac complications. These are somewhat nonspecific. For example, patients may present with transient EKG changes, an acute myocardial infarction, myocarditis, or pericarditis. However, rather than memorizing these specifics, just know that cardiac complications may occur. Finally, you may have noticed that these two guys are wearing hats. And we did this to help you remember that the influenza virus can cause neurological complications, such as aseptic meningitis. Okay, if we zoom back out, now you can see that we've shown a prominent ray piercing through the clouds and reflecting off of the window. The ray is here to help you remember that the influenza virus is associated with ray syndrome. This is a childhood encephalopathy associated with hepatic dysfunction that occurs after giving the child aspirin during a viral infection. This is why aspirin is almost never given to children. All right, now let's discuss vaccination. If we zoom up on the orthodontist again, you can see that he's injecting some lidocaine into the patient's mouth. The syringe that he's using is our symbol for a vaccine, 
and should help you remember that there is a killed vaccine for influenza. Remember, because influenza viruses exhibit genetic drift and are constantly changing, a novel vaccine has to be developed every year. This is why it's recommended to get the flu shot every year, and this is the killed version of the vaccine. We've also shown another syringe-shaped sign on the right. If we zoom up, you can see that the sign says live show and has some flowers on it. One of the fans waiting in line seems to be enjoying the scent and is breathing it all in. Anyway, the live show sign is our symbol for live vaccines and should help you remember that there is also a live attenuated vaccine for influenza. The fact that this guy is smelling the flowers nearby should help you remember that the live vaccine can replicate in the nose. However, once it enters the lungs where the body temperature is higher, the virus is unable to replicate because it has a mutation causing it to be temperature sensitive. Okay, now that we've covered the image, let's review with a question. A 64-year-old male presents to the physician due to a fever, cough, and shortness of breath that began yesterday. He states that he also had similar symptoms a week ago. His symptoms began to improve up until yesterday when they suddenly became worse. His temperature is 38.9 degrees Celsius, or 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Pulmonary auscultation reveals crackles in the lower lobes bilaterally. A sputum culture will most likely grow an organism with which of the following features? A. Pyocyanin production. B. Growth on charcoal yeast extract. D. Decreased meramic acid in the cell wall. Or D. Colonization of the nares. Hopefully from the question stem you notice that this patient had the flu followed by secondary bacterial pneumonia. His initial symptoms that began a week ago were improving up until yesterday when they suddenly became worse. Now he has a fever, cough, and shortness of breath along with crackles auscultated in the lower lobes of the lungs. So with this in mind, the correct answer is D, colonization of the nares. From the image, recall that the guys right next to the car right here represent that the influenza virus can cause primary pneumonia as well as secondary bacterial pneumonia. If we zoom up, you can see a tattoo of Merlin holding a staff right here. And this is a reference to our Staph aureus video. So this should help you remember that secondary bacterial pneumonia is commonly caused by Staph aureus. The lawnmower right here and the office sign right here should help you remember that strep pneumonia and Haemophilus influenzae also commonly cause secondary bacterial pneumonia. This is our Staph aureus image and recall that the dragon breathing fire out of its nostrils right here is here to help you remember that Staph aureus colonizes the nares. So if we return to the question, you can see that D is the correct answer because Staph aureus colonizes the nares. A is a reference to Pseudomonas, B is a reference to Legionella, and C is a reference to Chlamydia. Each of these organisms can cause pneumonia, but are not as commonly associated with secondary bacterial pneumonia. So all of them are incorrect. So again, the correct answer is D colonization of the nares, and this is caused by Staph aureus due to secondary bacterial pneumonia. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about the influenza virus.